So I'll introduce the panel just briefly and then they'll each give an introduction of themselves, their farming operation, how they got into it, and a little bit about, in particular, I think the evolution of their agritourism operations as well as helpful. How did you get started and how have you kept up with trends as things have changed? So we have Pete Aiello with Yusugi Farms. Yusugi grows a, a lot of produce and they also have a pumpkin park, which is what he's here talking about today. He's also the president of the Farm Bureau right now, so he's essentially my boss. <laughs> <laughs> and then Brent Benino with LJB Farms. They do a, primarily a farm stand, it's kind of their agritourism in the San Martin area. Andy Mariani with Andy's Orchard here in Morgan Hill. He's been in the paper lately because He's kind of the face of uh, some South County farmers who might be losing some water this year because of the drought. And then Lisa Garibaldi with Shady Creek Farm out here off Watsonville Road. And Kim Windsor with Windsor Farm in San Martin. So that's just a brief overview and then each of you will have a few minutes, maybe four or five minutes to tell us about yourself. So maybe Kim will start down at that end if that's all right. <laughs> no pressure. Um, yeah, our, our farm name isn't as creative as some of these. We're just like we're Windsor family and we're Windsor family farm. Uh, we have five kids and we moved to San Martin in 2001 or so. And we immediately jumped into 4-H and we just wanted to embrace the whole wonderful little family dream. And my kids don't mind farming anymore. But um, we were in 4-H for 10 years and we loved it. And it was our tutorial for life, um, everything we do in 4-H. Um, so we started with sheep for fun, goats for fun, and then we thought, well, we need some income from this. So we got 50 chickens and 100 chickens and 50 and another 100 and 200. And, um, so we sold eggs to a CSA, a delivery service, and it was awesome, but it was becoming too kind of time consuming for me to clean the eggs and park them and meet up with them. It wasn't that big a deal, but it was one more thing on my plate. And I felt like the money I was getting from the eggs was just feeding the chickens, and it was like <laughs> doing this silly cycle. So we sold off most most of our chickens. We had about 150 left. Um, and there were, for some eggs, it also was fun. So that's kind of my year-round income that doesn't do much. Um, and I, it's wonderful. I love it. So um, about seven, eight years ago, some friends said they want to come hang out at the farm. So I built a farm camp. Um, and kids would come for five mornings, one week, and learn about the animals and do crafts and stuff. So we developed that, and um, Facebook and word of mouth is our only advertising. And we, um, we just do it like four weeks in the summer, but it produces interest and pay customers and port customers and field trip interest and stuff. So it's, it's all working out and everything really. But um, I love it. If you have to have passion for it, you can't look at the dollar signs too much. <laughs> I'm Lisa Garibaldi, um, Shady Creek Farm. Um, I grew up here in Morgan Hill and grew up actually on the farm that I'm living in now. Um, I moved away when I went to college and came back um, after my dad passed away a few years ago. And so I went from, from living on the farm as a child um, to coming back to a dormant farm um, where we had no more animals and we had animals growing up, horses, goats and sheep and stuff like that. But um, my, as my dad was, got, older, got rid of all the animals, so we came back and, and are now um, starting to bring the animals back and uh, started two years ago raising chickens because they're fun and, um, and since then I have started uh, teaching classes on backyard chickens for, for people who want to raise chickens in their own backyard and mostly in urban settings. Um, and, but it's also given uh, us an opportunity to teach classes at the farm and I found that a lot of people were really interested in coming and seeing how the chickens lived and, and so um, I met up with a group of, of ladies in my neighborhood, in my neighborhood because we're all on farms, um, that have chickens and I learned a lot from them. They've been great mentors in terms of not just raising chickens but um, on all kinds of homesteading um, opportunities. 
And so we now have um, goats, sheep, alpacas, bees, chickens, ducks, cats and dogs. Um, and, uh, and we found that there's, just by me posting pictures of what I've been doing on the farm to get things kind of running again, people started showing an interest on, um, you know, hey, do you guys do farm tours? Can we come to your farm? Can we have a party at your farm? And, and so we found a great opportunity there, but, um, but we're not quite set up yet. So, so I've kind of been like holding the reins, and, uh, but looking forward to, to, to moving in that direction. Um, I'm also on the uh, Ag Tourism uh, Alliance here in, in Morgan Hill. So um, I'm really interested to hear about what you guys are, are planning on doing and um, how, how we can help um, you know, bring agritourism to, to Morgan Hill and, and be more cooperative. Um, I found just by working with these ladies that the cooperative part of it is very, um, very helpful. And I think you know, there's power in the first. Um, our family's been here since 1957. We used to have a farm in Cupertino. Uh, before we moved here, um, it was on the Anza Boulevard, and now it would be across the street from the headquarters of that computer. Um, we sold a little bit too early, I think. Um, but we, <laughs> well, we moved here in 1958, and basically our family grew apricots and prunes for drying. And this was a tradition in the Santa Clara. Um, at the time, uh, the, uh, the farmers came and settled here. Um, there was no refrigeration, there was no freezing, there was no, virtually no canning, there was no transportation. So you couldn't sell a lot of fruit fresh. So if you had excess fruit, you had to dry it. You, you, you transformed it into a more durable form and you sold it later, then you can sell it all over the world. And the Santa Clara Valley became famous for that. Um, when we came here, we did the same thing. We grew apricots and kernels. Um, my dad loved cherries, so we started cherries. Um, there is a built-in incentive to grow really quality fruit when you're growing it for drying. Because uh, the higher the sugar content, the more tree ripened it is, um, the better yield you get. When there's less shrinkage, you get better yield, and, and, and you have more profit. Um, we've always had that mindset. We've never been caught in the trap of uh, growing fruit for fresh market, uh, where shelf life and, and uh, you, know, you know, picking them green and, uh, and putting them in storage and, and, and shipping them long distances. Um, even when we grew cherries, most of our markets were, were local and pre ripe. Um, now, I think the seminal event that we had when we first started into this, what people are calling agritourism, was, uh, was, was establishing a fruit stand on our farm. Um, we wanted to sell fruit, it's a way of direct marketing. You cut out the middleman, you, get, you know, we tend to get more profit that way. Um, and so we started growing some other, other fruits besides apricots and prunes and cherries. Um, we started growing nectarines and peaches and, and, and plums, uh, market plums. And um, um, we tended to use to grow older varieties, ones that uh, you couldn't find in the grocery store. We tried to differentiate our product from what you get in the grocery store. Ours tend to have higher sugar content, which we ripen them, and they're the kind of varieties that have juice, taste good, and, and we were hoping that people would, uh, you know, be the path to our door and, and find these, you know, go to the farm and find these great fruit that you couldn't get anywhere else. <clears throat> now, uh, the problem is we're out there in the middle of nowhere. You know, we don't have a, we're not blessed with a good location. Um, but we wanted to showcase what we grew. So we came up with uh, the idea of a fruit tasting. And, um, you know, we thought they would come to the farm, they tasted the fruit, they liked it, they would buy it. Um, so we developed that concept. And uh, now we have kind of a, a combination of package deal where you, where you go to the farm and um, uh, it, it, it's an event. It's an event. It's only like three or four times a year, but it attracts people from the urban areas and they come to the farm and it only lasts about two and a half hours, um, but they taste the fruit and then they go out on, a, on an educational tour and there's also something called a farm, uh, excuse me, a, an orchard walk, which is a 
thin, thinly veiled, kind of disguised way of saying, you pick. <laughs> and and um, uh, so our, our investment, actually our investment in the, in the infrastructure, so to speak, was a few canopies and some plastic buckets. There wasn't much more. There was a lot of work involved, a lot of labor involved, but not much more than that. And um, uh, 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 so it's all guided. Uh, we rely a lot on, on volunteer uh, labor, actually. Um, there's people that are docents that guide the people around. First of all, we have, we have a big taste, and everybody uh, tastes the different varieties. And sometimes in the middle of the summer, we'll have as many as 80 different things to taste. Um, we also have sometimes cooking demonstrations. We have people that offer books about fruit. They come and have a book signing. So there's a lot of different things going on. Um, initially, we didn't charge for our tasting. Because we thought, okay, they come here, they like what they taste, and they buy the fruit. And the whole idea was just to bring them out there. Um, then we were attracting a, a group that, I wouldn't say that they were stingy, but they were pretty cheap. And they did not, they, they'd eat everything and they'd leave, and they wouldn't buy it. So then we, we, we decided that we have to turn this thing all around. And, and I, 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 had, I got the suggestion of one of the uh, UC Extension people, which was one of my docents. Uh, we rely on really a lot of educated people that, that lead them around. She said, your, your attitude should be, these people should pay for the privilege of getting out of their car and walking onto your place and having a real farm experience, uh, being able to, 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 to pick food right off the tree and, and, and being able to eat it right there. So we, we said, okay, we're going to charge that. So I think we started out with $10 uh, an adult. Uh, children were free because we, we wanted this thing to be an educational thing for kids and so that they can make a connection between what you, what you, you know, uh, the, the, the food that you eat, you know, they, they, they actually pick the food off the tree. Uh, so kids were free and, 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 and seniors had some sort of a, you know, senior system discount. That's how we started. Now it's, I think it's, it's $15? Yeah, $15 and I think we're going to up to $18. This is an experience that they want. And um, one of the biggest problems we have is parking. Um, uh, we have to almost devote several acres to park. Because the event is, is an event. It, it lasts only about two and a half hours. And we do have um, um, open houses during Christmas time where it's kind of continuous throughout the whole day. But this thing, it, what's good about it is in terms of labor, it's, it's, it's there, it's, they go through it, and it's done, and, and they go home. And um, the biggest problem we have is actually preparing for it. We have to pick the fruit, catalog it, label it, slice it you know, right away that, that morning. Um, we have to be cognizant of all the food safety rules. And so I don't rely on, on volunteers for that. That's, people have to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, so I pay to have them. Those are my workers. Yeah, but the volunteers are usually the, um, the people who lead, who lead the tours. And um, uh, so I, I rely on that. Um, do we make money uh, at that? I mean, just by itself? Yeah, probably a little bit. But I still feel that this agritourism part of our entire farming operation is just an adjunct of, you know, we, we're in the business of growing and selling fruit. That's what we do best. Agritourism is something that we've kind of hit upon to help us promote that. Uh, but it's not, it's not for us, at least, it's not a business unto itself. Um, I guess that's it. <laughs> uh, my name is Brent Bonino. Um, I work for LJB Farms. Uh, LJB stands for Louie and Judy Bonino, who are my parents. Uh, my family has been in this area. Um, actually, my great-grandfather uh, and my grandfather came here in 1917 and settled in San Martin, and we've been here uh, in ag ever since. Um, <clears throat> I was born and raised uh, in the house that my parents still live in, that where we have our uh, fruit stand. Uh, I was born and raised into the business. I've learned a lot over the years. Um, I, uh, you know, coming up through high school and even into college, the last thing I wanted to do was be in the ag industry. Um, it just was, uh, uh, it was too hard. Um, there was, uh, you worked too hard and the margins were too small and there was no stability. Um, but after I got out of college and bounced around and tried to figure out 
who I was, what I wanted to do. Um, I maintained um, my career uh, working at, uh, for my family during the, during the summer and into the fall. And as I grew older, the appreciation that I had for uh, what I have uh, grew as I matured. Um, we are now, um, I have a, an older brother who actually does um, all the farming uh, with my father and I handle all the, um, the business operations, the day-to-day -day operations out of our fruit stand um, with my mother. Um, we are, quote unquote, the family farm. Um, we do have uh, a, not, not a whole lot of employees, but uh, people that have been with us for a long time to help us uh, go get to where we need to go. And you know, we realize that agritourism is kind of the way of the future. Um, we, like Andy, um, for a long time just figured that you know, if you worked hard enough and you raised good product and provided a good product at a fair price to the public, everything would be okay. We all know that uh, that's not true anymore. Um, you know, we work extremely hard and it, uh, the margins are getting increasingly smaller um, to be successful. So we have a tendency to uh, lean on those within the community that are in the same industry to help um, go ahead to, to help uh, move us forward. Um, I am lucky enough to do business with both of these gentlemen right here, and they have helped um, uh, as well as Kim for a while. Um, we did business with her to, um, to further our business, and um, we have uh, since started looking into over the last few years doing uh, smaller tours of groups. Um, most of them have been with um, uh, some groups from other countries, um, but then there's also been some domestic groups from people, farmers from the Midwest, from down from out in the Deep South, that have come out and wanted to see what California agriculture was all about. Um, we figure we've got a, a pretty good idea and a uh, hold on uh, how to get the farming done and but this whole agritourism thing is a uh, is a is a learning process I mean every year it's it's something new um, one of the keys that I have found for us to be successful is that the things that I like to do is I like to promote the other growers that we do business with I have no problem um, telling everybody that we buy our strawberries from Yusuke Farms because we feel that they have the best strawberries in the valley. I have no problem telling everyone that we buy our peaches and nectarines and cherries because he is the best grower of stone fruit in the state of California, probably in the United States. Um, those are the things, those are the key components that I use to, to try to help further uh, our business plan as well as using you know, when you tell, when you bring these people in from other parts of the country and they hear about the stories that come along with the growers that you're doing business with as well as yourself, they're interested and they want to know. And we found out that uh, everybody wants to hear the story. Everybody wants to learn about something they have very little knowledge about. Um, every time I hire a new employee, the one thing I tell them out of the gate is that you are not just getting a job here, you are becoming an educator. Whether you like it or not, the ag industry is a very small field, relatively speaking, um, and people want to know about it. So you have to be willing to educate people. You have to tell them what is the difference between a Z Lady peach and a Silver Logan peach. Um, the different characteristics, the different tastes, things like that. You know, we specialize actually in row crops. Um, it's like corn and tomatoes and squash, uh, beans, cucumbers, bell peppers, things like that. We grow a wide variety of different products. Um, so our business, what we try to do in, at the, the fruit stand is we try to educate people on the differences between seven different varieties of tomatoes and see which one. This way we let them, they can have opportunity to try them, see which ones they like, and that helps us further for next year to see what we should probably grow. So um, that's basically about it for me. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> so I'm Pete Aiello. Uh, that's A-I-E-L-L-O. There's a little bit of a typo on the flyer. 
Um, so <laughs> it's, I missed that one. I, I just, I caught Yusugi, but I didn't catch Aiello, so my bad. Uh, anyway, so I run Yusugi Farms, and a quick story about why I have an Italian last name, but I run a company with a Japanese name. Um, George Yusugi started Yusugi Farms here in Morgan Hill in the 1950s. Uh, he was of, of Japanese descent, but born here in California, and actually fought for the U.S. Army in World War II in the 442nd in the South Pacific against the Japanese. Well, the U.S. government, in its infinite wisdom, when he came back from the war, decided that he was an enemy of the state, and they interned him and took away almost all of his land. Uh, so later on, he got out of the camp and managed to get at least some of the land back and resumed farming. And George is one of those guys that uh, had to do everything himself. He couldn't trust a lot of people. He just, you know, he was from the old school. You want it done right, you do it yourself type of thing. And so his health, of course, started failing a little bit uh, kind of early on. I think he was only in his 50s. And the doctor basically told him, look, you better get some help or you better quit. It's one of those two. Well, so George wasn't going to get help, so quitting was the, <laughs> the leftover option. Um, so that's when he met my dad, Joe. My dad was just a young guy out of Cal Poly um, who got a degree in crop science in 1971 and he was farming here in Morgan Hill. He managed to convince my grandparents to loan him a little bit of money to get some land here in the north end of Morgan Hill and start farming tomatoes and whatnot. Um, and so my family, the story on my family is we come from Sicily and I'm actually from a long line of farmers, and if it hadn't been for my grandpa, who was probably the smartest guy ever, and said, there is no way in hell I'm going to farm, <laughs> I would be a, a seventh, eighth generation farmer by now, but as it stands, I'm only the second, because my grandpa took a generation off. So, so my dad essentially was a first generation farmer. He started basically from nothing, but he had a lot of passion for it. He grew up in San Jose, and he worked in the orchards, and as he got older, he got summer jobs out in the valley and worked for Beach Nut and a few other companies out there and uh, decided he wanted to farm since he was a real young guy. And uh, so as luck would have it, he met George in the early 70s when he was farming here. And again, George was looking to hand his business off to somebody. And he got my dad and another fellow by the name of Dennis Humphreys together. And Dennis was a tractor salesman back then, sold George tractors. And I think he even sold my dad a tractor or two as well. George put my dad and Dennis together and said, look, guys, i got to get out of this deal. I need somebody to get my business to. Would you guys be interested in taking it over? And neither one of them had much of a pot to pee in at the time, my dad especially. Um, he was growing tomatoes one year in the early 70s. It rained in August, wiped out the whole thing. And he, I mean, he didn't have really a penny to his name as it was. So... <clears throat> My dad said, George, I'd love to, but I have no zero money. And George said, Joe, don't worry. I'll give you the business for a couple of years. No money down. Operate for a couple of years, start making payments to me. So in April of 79, uh, my dad and Dennis acquired eight acres, a couple of little farm all tractors, I think a flatbed truck or two, and started going. And uh, I remember the day we, we sent George's final check. So we, we survived long enough to at least pay George off. <laughs> um, so anyway, that, that was back in the late 70s and we, you know, we, uh, we just kind of made a mantra of, of working hard, as hard as we can, uh, taking risks, trying to seize opportunities when they prevent them, present themselves, and just hopefully get a little lucky along the way. And in this business, you actually need that. You need a lot of luck. Um, and it's, it's worked out and we, you know, we grew the business from that eight acres um, and about 100 acres that we were renting um, to about 3,000 across the state. And down in Mexico too, we have another 1,000 acres down there. So we have a 12 month operation now and we move from region to region. So our business, kind of like Andy stated before, our business is all about growing, packing, shipping, handling all the post-harvest, the cooling and the sorting and grading and all that. that. That's what we do. And being a little bit of a larger operation, you know, we sell in volume to wholesalers or to retailers, uh, to terminal markets and things like that. 
But just like in any business, we were looking for alternative streams of revenue and looking for ways to diversify and spread the eggs out a little bit, if you would. So it was back in 1985 when we decided, hey, let's grow some pumpkins, see how that goes. And like the rest of our operation, we really have no idea what we're doing, <laughs> but, but we take the risk and we just, we just jump in and we try to figure it out. Uh, so we grew five acres of pumpkins in 1985, just right down here on Monterey Road, about a mile south of us, uh, near our original headquarters. And when we started it, it was just literally a five acre field of pumpkins and that was it. So people would come in, they would get their pumpkins, they'd bring them to the front, and we'd stick them through this little holes in the plywood to measure how big they were, and, you know, that would be $2 or $3 or whatever it was. And we did that for a couple, two or three years, and um, it was going real well. You know, we knew how to grow pumpkins, that's fine. But beyond that, we didn't really have any experience or any idea about how to market things to the end consumer. Uh, we had no idea what the end consumer wanted, what their tendencies were. And so when it got to the point where Growing and selling the pumpkins was good, fine and dandy, but not much growth was coming out of it. We decided, well, we gotta spice things up a little bit. We gotta add stuff to, to the pumpkin operation. You know, make this thing more of an attraction for people to come to. So just kind of out of the blue, we started adding things like little 24 gauge trains for people to ride on. Um, we ended up starting to serve food and beverages, and then we started to bring in live entertainment, and then we started to do things like hay rides and pumpkin cannons where you could shoot old beat up trucks with pumpkins and stuff. People really like that, by the way, it's, it's fun. So we just kind of, it just kind of evolved. We had no idea when we started this thing in 1985 what it was gonna become. So a few years after we started, we ended up moving to a different property where it is today, just a little further south down Monterey and on the west side of the highway. And we added all this stuff, all these attractions, and uh, you know now we, we see probably about 150,000 people come through there every October, and um, lots, a lot of school tours too. We, we had, I think, almost 20,000 kids and we bring them in and we educate them about how pumpkins grow and we you know, take them on tours and all that stuff. Um, so anyway, yeah, like I said, we, we don't really know what we're doing, but things just kind of happen and we just work as hard as we can to, uh, to ride the wave. And so the pumpkin patch has really evolved into a great conduit to our community because I don't think that a lot of folks would even know who we were if it weren't for that patch, at least here locally. You know, we deal with all these folks around the state and we sell product all over the country and across borders and everything. But I don't think if, if it wasn't for that patch, that pumpkin patch, I don't even know if our own backyard would even know who we were. So that's been a great thing to expose us to our community. It's a great conduit to the community. It's not a huge money maker. We, we put a lot of money into it. So we, we're lucky if we turn at least a little bit of a profit, but really that's all we're looking for as long as it's somewhat profitable and we continue to have that direct line to the community and let those folks know what's going on you know with us and with agriculture then uh, that's good enough for us and the other thing too I don't know if we'll discuss it much today but we, we run a couple of farm stands as well we just built a new building down on highway 25 which is near our current headquarters now um, and kind of like the pumpkin patch we just jumped into this thing not having any idea how to run one so we're figuring it out as we go. So I'm, I'm good friends with Brent, so I, I watch closely. <laughs> you, you look at the guys who succeed and you try to, you know, try to emulate that. So anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you all for the overviews. I'm going to take a few minutes and just ask some questions of the panelists. You're welcome to all answer if you'd like, in which case, please keep it short, or if it's maybe a little bit more pointed. Um, and then we'll go to some audience questions after that. So one that I think is interesting, you're trying to decide what you want to do. If anybody's got something in mind, they probably have it shaped in their minds a little bit already. But then the next question becomes, if I build it, will they come? So what connections for you have proven useful? How do you get the urban public down here to, to your facility? So if everyone wants to take just a, a minute, 60 seconds, 30 seconds, to answer that, specifically, how, how do you attract people? 
Pete, we'll start here. Uh, so we've, we have thrived on word of mouth more than anything, but to enhance that a little bit, we also invest in a lot of advertising, uh, TV, radio, and print. And now, with the way things are going these days, it's all about social media. So we've now invested in folks that help us advertise via Twitter or Facebook, uh, Instagram, you know, various things like that. Uh, we have uh, a nice website as well for the pumpkin patch. So that's, uh, that's how we've done it. Um, we uh, basically, Peter hit on all the points that uh, we kind of did. We built our business over the years of, of word of mouth. And um, we were fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time when they decided to, Michael Bonfani decided to build a theme park in Gilroy. Um, to get to that theme park, you have to go in front of our fruit stand. Um, we have taken advantage of that. Uh, we, not that we were resistant to social media um, when it first started, I, we see the value of it and how important it is in today's society. It's just that uh, we didn't have any idea how to do it. We were all, you know, my parents, my brother and I are very, very old school when it comes to all that stuff. It was all word of mouth. It was advertising in the paper, um, the radio, this and that. And then when this came along with the theme park, we got um, very, very lucky. Uh, since that time, to expand our business, we have started jumping into social media and we have seen the, a significant jump uh, through using social media. Um, so that's basically how we do it. Um, we don't do much in the way of advertising. I think it's maybe once in a while. And, um, but maybe I want to make a point, and that is um, uh, we get a lot of free posts. And, and, yeah. and that's great. And, and you should try to have people write about your farm. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of magazines, there's a lot of newspapers that are willing to feature a little farm, perhaps that, that's that's doing this kind of thing. Um, in our case, this past summer, um, we had an article written about us in Cincinnati Magazine. Now, um, it didn't seem like I mean, it was a nice, I mean, beautiful, beautiful article, and it was free. It was free advertising. It's unbelievable. Um, um, what happened was our tours went from. Um, usually a max of about 300 people per, per tour went up to 600. So, so it, it works, and and the cheaper you can get it done, the better. Uh, and, and in our case, it just you know if, if you have a good product or you have a good, you have a good a good concept of what you're doing, and and the media gets a hold of it, it's it just you just right away. Great, Lisa. Um, well, same, same here. I mean, I think social media um, is, is, is really uh, helpful. Uh, like I said, we're trying not to advertise right now because we don't have the infrastructure to, to host a lot of things that people want us to do. Um, but last year when we did our Coop to Hill tour, um, there were probably, I don't know, six or seven coops that were on this tour. And we just did, um, we did some simple flyers. We, we um, posted it on our Facebook pages. And um, I think there was an article, like the first, one of the first articles of Morgan Hill Life. It, it hadn't even been published yet. Um, it's like your online article. So, so even just minimal amount of advertising we did, we got over 100 people that came from kind of all over the place. And this doesn't sound like a lot, and, and, it, and really it isn't, but for what, for what we were doing and how we were doing it, it was very organic and, um, and it was a lot of fun. And, um, and there were people that came out. And, and as you get people to come out, we're also in a really good location too. We're on Watsonville Road near Cola Chance. So we have people that are going to Gilroy, people are going to wineries, and so if all I had to do is put a sign out there and said fresh eggs, in fact we get people, they can see our chicken coops from the road, and they can see the chickens out there, they'll just come down our driveway and ask for eggs, and, and so we have to keep our gates closed sometimes just to keep them away, but if we were to put a sign out that just said, you know, fresh fruit or fresh egg or fresh honey or whatever, um, probably would get even more, but um, 
but but as a result of the the Coop to Hill thing, um, we got a lot more interest. So I think uh, word of mouth, social media, um, and then again that cooperative mm -hmm. um, effort. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kim, so for the egg business, it's mostly word of mouth, and we have some constant customers, some random customers. For the pork egg stuff, people find me online, and they want a egg for an event or whatever. Even if I don't have them, I can be the third party to find one. And then for the farm camps, kids, young families are very interconnected. You know, I know the family that went here from the school or from the group or whatever. And so um, building relationships with the families, they tell me kids come every year. Where is that certain chicken I like to have? <laughs> um, so relationship is more important to me than advertising. <laughs> um, and I purposely keep the groups small. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Um, one last question that I'll ask is, what obstacles, and this is for anyone to answer, were there some obstacles that you had to overcome, and what were those? Was it a risk, or was it access to capital? Was it family relationships? Is, if there's something that you learned from overcoming those obstacles that you could share that, that anyone has, open question for anyone who's interested. Lisa, I saw a head nod down there. <laughs> well, for me, it's like everything. Yeah, all the above. It's like I have, I have this great potential, and I know what I want, but I don't have the capital. I don't have the understanding in terms of what legally I can do or what I can get away with. Um, um, and then, you know, what, what health regulations there are for certain things that we want to do and, and uh, you know, if I should get certain insurance. I mean, all the things that you guys are going to learn today, I'm going to be learning too, which is why I think this is a very valuable workshop because having just the questions answered will help me get, go, get on the right track and figure out where I go from there. Great. Frank? I think one of our, our biggest things is, I mean, anybody that farms can relate to this is that us we as farmers have to put our money up out in front mm -hmm. and so with that being said when you're putting money out for a product in November that you don't harvest until June that you get paid in December <laughs> the to implement new things in um, such as trying to do events and things like yeah. that the capital is very minimal it's a cash flow. Um, because yes because you have we put, I mean, you know, my dad always said, he's always said, if you want to meet the biggest gamblers in the world, they're sitting in this room. And, uh, you know, and, it, and it, we always put all our money up front and we hope that everything breaks our way, mm -hmm. you know. So um, capital is probably the biggest obstacle mm -hmm. for us. Yeah, Andy? Um, yeah, I, I fully agree with that. Uh, money's always, always a, an issue. Um, I think also is, just the planning and organization that, that's involved. A lot of people don't realize how much planning you have to do for for an event or, or some sort of thing that you're wanting to do from the standpoint of agriculture. Uh, it takes a lot of time to get that done. And if you're a farmer, you know, the first thing is you got to farm. And this is all kind of like, you know, you put this on the back burner and, and then you put it on the back burner again and, 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 then, and then summer comes and goes and you haven't really done anything. And so, so you have to find the time if you want this to be a segment of your farming enterprise, uh, an important one. Uh, you have to find the time to do this. And you know, Pete's Pete's place over there, that pumpkin patch. I'm so amazed because they got that thing so well organized. Not only do they do that, they must have hired a whole bunch of consultants. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Well, his wife runs it. He's here getting yes. credit. So. Yes. <laughs> that's that's how we do it. Pete, did you For, want to add? Yeah, for, for us, um, for us, a big challenge is, is regulations. You know, we, uh, it's a, an operation like that, well, any, gosh, any kind of farming operation or any operation, period, I guess, you know, it's just, you know, we, we just face increasingly tougher and more stringent regulations every day, you know, from federal, state, and local authority. Um, and we've had a really tough road to hoe there with that pumpkin patch with, with uh, you know our local regulators especially, um, and it's it costs a lot of money to comply. Uh, it takes a lot of time to comply. It takes a lot of effort to comply, and uh, it sometimes can get in the way and often does of you operating your business. You know after you do all this compliance, 
stuff, then you actually got to go do your day job, which is already plenty hard enough. And so, you know, with, uh, I guess with, with populations getting bigger and government getting bigger along with the population, you know, there's, there's just going to be more and more bureaucracy and more and more red tape, and it just gets tougher and tougher every year to get over that hump. Um, so we, we've had, we've had a tough time with that, but you know, it's, it's here and it ain't going away and it's increasing and not decreasing and you just got to try to deal with it as best you can. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Yeah. I would add, um, connecting like Jane and the 4-H poultry community, we call each other random disease, random <coughs> If you don't have connections, you feel like you're having to reinvent the wheel all the time. Uh -huh. And these guys in their row crops, God bless you, I wish I could do that. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, if you don't have the connections, yeah, great. Good comment. Okay, any questions from the audience for our panelists? Mm -hmm. For any questions? Yes, yeah, great. Um, for anyone who does like school tours, how do you approach the schools and get them interested? And what are they looking for from you? Maybe we can get a couple panel members to comment on school tours. How do you approach them? What do they want? Kim? So, personally, I haven't pushed it because we're small and I don't want 50 conscious kids on my property. But, um, Private schools are good because the kids well behaved and the classes are small. So I've talked to teachers and parents that I know there. Um, public schools, PA Walsh, I'm in discussion with, but they haven't, you know, they have to rent the class and it gets a little more logistical. Um, but again, parents and, and teachers are your best. Mm -hmm. Great. Anyone else experience the school tours? Want to make a comment? We, uh, we start by uh, just doing some research, you know, via the internet mostly to, to look at all of our local districts here in the Bay Area. And we, uh, we get uh, school names and mailing addresses and we send out flyers every year. Um, and we have a growing database of schools now that have come to our place. So we, you know, we have them already on file. Uh, and we target everything from the Bay Area all the way down to say the Monterey Bay Area. So we, we cover a good four or five counties. And uh, so we send them flyers and basically, you know, we, we charge, I think, $6 per child. And uh, that gets them uh, a little pumpkin and something to eat and something to drink. And then the full tour and educational experience. And uh, so we actually have a lady that works for us and her Basically, your full-time job is just to manage these tours, to do all the bookings and scheduling, and then she will schedule all of the tour guides. Uh, we have about 10 or 15 of them, and uh, we'll, you know, some days we're running a thousand kids through there, so we'll have multiple tours going on at the same time, and which requires scheduling amongst the different tour guides, and you know, one of them is going to start in this spot, and the other one starts in this spot. And then the other ones start in these different spots and they all have to be like gears in a machine to make sure they're not overlapping and kids are waiting and stuff like that. So it's, it's quite an ordeal. But uh, you know, like everything else, we started small with just one guide or two and now the, the demand for the tours has increased so we add more guides and we bring in more schools and it seems to be working okay. Great. Other questions? Yes, Jane. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I'm going to stand so I can see. We work with tour operators quite often with our organization, and both domestic and international. There's tremendous interest in this industry. And the three, the three things they ask for um, when saying, you know, who can, I, who can I just see in my boot set? You know, they're looking for parking, or they're a 40 person bus. They're looking for bathrooms. At, you know, it's one of the basic things is that you can have the And then third, a consistency of opportunity to visit. Meaning, are they open nine, ten months a year to, uh, so I can bring, actually schedule it for a couple of times a week. So that's a big And so that would be something I would ask those that are doing this if they are interested in that. And then seven, I'll just point out, we work with friends a couple of times already. And friends is actually featured in Australia. I'm huge in Australia. <laughs> you guys don't know you're sitting with a superstar. Bruce, right? You did so well when you brought that film crew in from Australia. You told your story, and that's what people love. They want to hear your stories. I can't really emphasize that. 
that or not. But anyway, interested in who might be interested in consistency of visits by two of those. Well, I'd like to comment on that. We did do some, we did do some work, and we, we brought in a, a, a two separate groups, one from the Czech Republic and one from the Japanese. Um, it, these tours have, uh, over the last few years, have really done a, um, a great service for us as far as getting our name out there to not only the local people, but, of course, um, outside our area. Um, I was telling the story this morning to someone that um, we were very resistant to tour groups um, that were not domestic tour groups um, in, the, in the outset. Um, we've actually warmed up to the idea over the last couple of years. Um, the reason we were resistant to it was because about 15 to 20 years ago we had a, a group of Chinese come in and did a tour and wanted to know about our farming operations and our practices and this and that. And basically what it boiled down to was they were coming over, learning our secrets, using them, went home, implemented them, and used them against us on um, the global market. I mean, they went home and they grew garlic, which basically, and they started importing all the garlic, which crushed our domestic product. Um, we, couldn't, we couldn't raise the product here for what they were bringing it in and selling it for. Um, so when that happens to you uh, a couple times, you get a little sour. And um, But we have since, I mean, with the advancement of the internet and everything, that information's out there now. And so um, the groups that we've dealt with this last couple of years were very gracious, wanted to learn about California Ag, and we were very receptive um, to them and we just came to tell our story. Um, they showed up, they wanted to know, and they were, they honestly, I, it, the best part about those tours is that you get to meet people from all over the world, people that don't even speak English. Um, we had to use translators for both of them. But when you get right down to it, we're all the same. You know, everybody, they're great people, they're really nice, and these people came in, and they were like, these sixth graders that come to Pete's Pumpkin Patch. I mean, they had smiles on their faces and they were joking and laughing and, and wanted to, I mean, they wanted to, they were like a sponge. They wanted to soak up as much information because they were on a farm in California. And so uh, it was such a positive experience for us that, you know, these are the things that we're looking into more and more to try to um, grow our business, um, not only, you know, in the local arena, but also on a, on a larger scale out to Australia, because I think our next satellite is going to be in Australia. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, you know, I had those same Chinese come and, 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 and the thing is, I, I don't know, when, when, I, when I have these, these people from foreign countries come, I don't charge. And I don't know if that's something that you do. Also, I'm seasonal. Um, you know, we can start in June and end in September, but Beyond, and then we have a Christmas thing, but, but uh, we had the last tour was French Canadians, uh, and some of them knew some English and some of them didn't, and they were from Montreal, so they weren't really too familiar with Super Um But but I didn't charge them, and I'm not sure. Do, do you, are you charging for these people? Yeah. Okay. Um, that's interesting because I I, I have a habit of not charging. <laughs> So we had some, we had a, a homeschool kids. Now, don't, don't do homeschool kids, really. <laughs> they were climbing on the track, but there was no discipline whatsoever. <laughs> and, and, you know, but I always thought that, okay, they're gonna buy something, you know. And, and uh, so these French, these French, uh, these French Canadians, they came in and they almost cleaned us out of our store. So that was great. I didn't charge them, but we did well. Um, um, but um, uh, my problem is it is seasonal. So I don't know if that's something that, you, that, that somebody can work with. Okay. Well, we're gonna gonna wrap up here, but just last question that I'll throw out there is: Is there a piece of advice that someone has given you along the way that's been especially enlightening, or just advice <coughs> from yourselves that you could share with folks today that would have been helpful to know when you started out, or something you've learned along the way? Yeah, starting with Lisa. I was gonna say the Farm Bureau really is a good place to start because with Jennifer I, I when we first started out I'm like I have no idea what we're doing where we're going or 
or where to even start. So I contacted Jennifer and you know right away she started doing some research for me and, and gave me some at least places to start and um, and they just they're just a really good resource and and, um, and I'm really delighted to be working with her in a number of different ways. So Andy, did you have uh, yeah, I just reiterate uh, what I said before with uh, Nancy Garrison, who is a retired UC extension person. She's the one that suggested charge, charge for the tours, mm -hmm. and, and it turned out to be great because uh, people appreciate it more. Mm -hmm. And and so now uh, it is something that we can make a little bit of money on. Before I just thought it was something that we should be doing as a I don't know uh, just, just as a service, yeah. But we want people to know what we're doing yep. and and to interface with the urban population so they understand what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And and that was good in and of itself, but but to to be, a, be able to cover your costs, make a little bit of money, that, that's that's mm -hmm. good. great. I think the one piece of advice that um, that I really value um, is that don't be afraid to work with other people in your same industry. Um, you know, I, I I use the example that we're all in this together. I mean, the only way you know we're going to survive as individuals is we have to work with everybody else in the ag community starting with using Jennifer at the Farm Bureau but you know one of the things I tell everybody is that you know I use our, our business model is based around the things that we don't grow we go out and we source from people that are the best at what they do and we're fortunate enough to live in this valley where we have the best growers in the world and I have no problem telling people that, you know, this is where I buy my peaches, this is where I buy my strawberries and my bell peppers, and, um, you Can know, a it's, he has, he has a fruit stand within a fruit stand that says Andy's Orchard. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's, that's that. the best advertising I can get. Well, it, it, it is. I mean, it, the only way we're all going to survive is people have to know where, they want to know, that's the biggest thing, people want to know where their stuff's coming from now. I mean, they have, we've had numerous scares over the last decade. Um, 15 years where people have gotten sick and died from cantaloupes, tomatoes, cilantro, I mean whatever it is. So people want to be informed, they want to know. So people come in and ask me, you know, where do the bell peppers come from? They come from Yusugi Farms in Gilroy, you know, we get them from them. You know, we grow the corn, I get the peaches and nectarines and apricots from Andy's and they're picked every day. You. Don't be afraid to share information with who you're doing business with because on the flip side, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we're getting the same yeah. <laughs> on, the, on the back side. But I wouldn't be afraid to you know, reach out to those in, you know, also in, in your same field. Uh -huh. you know? Great. Kim or Pete, did you want to share? The, that's uh, just to echo what Brent's saying, that's exactly how, how we've done it over the years in all facets of our operation and really just a lesson in life in general is you look at you look at others that are successful in what they're doing and if you're getting into that kind of business you 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 know you go you meet those people you talk to them you go visit their operations um, as much as Half Moon Bay now is a big rival of ours I have to admit when we were first starting this pumpkin patch deal we went up there to check them out and see what they were all about and we got some great ideas and still to this day we look at other operations that are similar to ours and see what they're doing or not doing and you'll find that even your competition you know like Brent mentioned will be will be pretty friendly especially in the ag industry you know we're all good honest down-to-earth people and we do all want our industry as a whole to be strong collectively because in the end that helps all of us so you reach out to those people and just go and check check out what they're doing and you learn a lot I would just say keep some passion because in the business world it can be cutthroat and all about the dollar and these guys know that it's a lot of passion through the thick and thin and there will be bumps but um, we love what you do. Great. All right. Well, join me in thanking our, our panelists. So again, um, thank you so much to Jennifer, Pete, Brent, Andy, Lisa, and Kim for those wonderful stories, all that information, and generosity of sharing all that information with you.